Have you been blessed so far? Uh, just again, want to express my appreciation and thanks to all of our volunteers, our, our leaders. Um, thank you to our youth worship, Jaylene and the team, you guys being willing. We were brought to the throne of God today. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O oh, my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We are studying, discussing, experiencing the topic of forgiveness in this latest series of sermons that I have been doing. The language of the biblical language of salvation is extremely rich and diverse, and we use a lot of words like redemption and ransom and justification and sanctification, reconciliation, and all of these words add to the dynamics of the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. But I've really been sticking with just that basic word of forgiveness, um, and not that one has greater depth or, or greater meaning than the other, but um, I think from a uh, just a basic uh, day-to-day relational uh, way of looking at it, we relate maybe a little bit more to just the basic concept and the basic term of forgiveness than maybe the more kind of detailed uh, theological terms like redemption and reconciliation and, and those things. So, we're, we touch on, on different words as we go along, but been sticking to the basic theme of forgiveness, and we're going to continue on with that um, this morning, uh, as the Lord leads us. Uh, I do want to have a kid's quiz, as uh, Kelly Sue gave the uh, update and let us know. So, if I have some trained technical microphone experts coming up here, appreciate Owen and Toby. You notice uh, we still have uh, little things with our sound system. We are working on getting our new sound system. Uh, there's been some logistical delays and things like that, but don't give up. Say a prayer on our behalf. I know Nassim and others are staying in touch. So hopefully sooner than later, uh, we will have uh, new equipment and we'll be able to uh, have a better experience with our sound system. We've been going through different stories we talked about Joseph. We're looking at some of the great stories of forgiveness in the Bible. We've talked about Joseph. Last week, the woman caught in adultery. We're just going to, for the quiz, some of the great stories of forgiveness. So, these twin brothers eventually reconciled despite earlier fights and disagreements. Boys, I saw you over here. So, Owen has got this one. Uh, let's give uh, Dylan. Say it into the mic, sir. Oh, Eric. One of you better go. You were just stretching. I love it. Just stretching. Well, this is like an auction. If I see you move, I'm calling your bid. Uh, yeah, right here. Kyle. Jacob and Esau. Yes, that's right. Jacob and Esau. Now, the depth of their reconciliation may not have been to the uh, level we would have liked it to have been, but there was a great time of, of uh, uh, forgiveness between them. This city was spared destruction and forgiven despite Jonah's expectation of destruction. What city? The entire city. Sean. He's right. The story of Jonah goes hand in hand with Nineveh. One of the great stories of forgiveness, an entire pagan city spared because of their willingness to repent. And uh, boy, that, that uh, story will just preach and preach and preach, I tell you. This wicked pagan king would eventually turn to God despite having destroyed Jerusalem and putting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace. All right, right? Nebuchadnezzar. Isn't that a great name? How come nobody names their kids Nebuchadnezzar these days? Nebuchadnezzar. I think that's a rich, wonderful story. One of the most underestimated stories, in my opinion, of redemption in all the Bible is the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Right in the heart of Daniel, you have this remarkable story of the conversion of the pagan king. Uh, we're going to see this guy in heaven, guys. Did you know that? Everything the Bible le leads us to see, we're going to be by Mr. Nezer up in heaven. He's going to be amongst us. Um, one of two individuals who the Holy Spirit worked through to give us holy scriptures who are not 
of the lineage of Abraham. Only two people of, in all the Bible did the Holy Spirit work through to give us Holy Scripture that were not Jews. Luke in the New Testament and Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. Think about that. Daniel 4 is not Daniel telling the story of Nebuchadnezzar. It is the firsthand writing of Nebuchadnezzar telling his story. Oh, we could get into that. The story of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel is not just about uh, uh, judgment and prophecy and history and fiery furnaces. It is a story about one of the greatest episodes of forgiveness that you can have. Nebuchadnezzar is how I remember to spell it. Nebuchadnezzar. Great name for any of you thinking about having kids. Little, little Neb, Nebi, Nebuchadnezzar. Jesus tells the story of a father who forgives his son, even though he wandered far from home and lived sinfully. We don't know his name. It's just a story, but he's known by a term. And so, are you stretching? See, now I don't know. Are you stretching? All right. Someone tickle his armpit or something. Okay. Let's give Eric a chance. <laughs> The prodigal son. Thank you very much. I'm trying not to leave anyone out. I, I'm watching over here too, and we got Toby and Owen helping out. He's known as the prodigal son. We've talked about this. A wonderful, wonderful story of forgiveness, of course. Last one. Last one. He has a powerful vision of Jesus on his way to Damascus and is forgiven and converted despite his earlier persecutions of Christians. Anyone? For the kids here, anyone? I see Anna and I see Harper here. Oh, she knew it, got it right. Saul, as he was known at that time, we eventually we would know him as Paul. I'm sorry if I missed a few hands or, or wasn't able to call on as many that wanted to participate. We do this usually at the beginning of most of my sermons uh, to engage uh, with the young people. So thank you, Toby and Owen, and to all you. Some of the great stories of forgiveness, and there's so many more in the Bible. Last week, I'm going to dovetail in uh, a little bit with, with this week. Last week, I did kind of a dramatization of the woman who was caught in adultery, a tremendous story of grace and, and the wisdom of Christ and working out that situation. But in that story, in that one little moment in the conversation that Jesus has with the woman, He gives us the simplicity and yet the beauty and depth of what forgiveness really is. And I just want to uh, pause a moment and, and review what Jesus says to the woman caught in adultery. They're, they're alone, it's private. And he says to her the words that we probably remember quite well, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And you say, well, that, you know, okay, but how do we, how do we you know, really parse this out? Um, it is important to recognize in the moment of Jesus forgiving, when he says, I do not condemn you, um, in, your, uh, in your bulletins, I, I put the insert again, some of the lessons we've been looking at and studying. Number eight in your in your insert says, forgiveness acknowledges justice, but is delighted by mercy, uh, borrowing the language of Micah. When Jesus says, I do not condemn you, He is not excusing sin. And we need to understand this. Forgiveness does not mean I did not receive pain, or you did not error, or what happened was not really sin. Okay? And sometimes we twist forgiveness into kind of dismissing the offense, whether it's our offense to God or someone else who's offended us. Jesus, when He says, neither do I condemn you, He said that. The whole meaning of it is, I could condemn you. I could. The actions that have brought you to this place are condemnable. But I have come as a Savior, not as one to condemn. John three seventeen. for God did not send His, send His Son to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be Three people know that verse. Yes, thank you for saying that. The world would be, He came as a Savior. Now, I want you to notice something else. When Jesus said that first part, neither do I condemn you, He was saying that with the shadow of the cross still ahead of Him. He was saying that based upon His commitment to pay the price of sin, including the sin of the very woman that was now before Him. He was saying that as a Savior prepared to take the penalty for everyone's sin. 
It's not just out of the kindness and generosity, well, I'm just going to today make this nice choice. It was based upon a sacrificial realization of what the penalty of sin would really be. But it was the act of choice to say, I am choosing to forego justice and rather, and I'm going to accept mercy. Forgiveness is the willingness to choose mercy when you have the right to demand justice and offering it first. The second part, that's our part of forgiveness. Oh, actually, I want to go back to that for a second. I want you, this is very important, and, and forgive me, I know I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I just find these, these elements to be so critical to our understanding of our own relationship with God and how He's working out the plan of salvation in our lives. Those who are lost in the last days, those who receive the wrath of God are not people of whom God is not forgiving It is those who are living in the sin of not accepting His forgiveness. Do you understand that? It is not that those in the lake of fire are saying, we we would really love to be forgiven, and God say, no, 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 you had your chance. I'm not going to do it. Those who are lost in the last days are those who are sinning by not accepting the forgiveness that Jesus offers. Do, Do you hear what I'm saying here? Everyone who is here today can live with the hope and promise that Jesus has already stated. Before we were born, Jesus forgave us for our sins, even the sins He knew we would commit. We stand here today with the promise that Jesus has forgiven us. He's not waiting for us to get to a point of of, of purity and of, of good works. He already... Okay, Vanessa, where are you? Okay, you don't get to participate. You're, 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 you're not allowed. This is a Twix. Very, very dynamic illustration. I want to give you this Twix. I want to give it to you. But if you don't take it, you're not going to get it. But I'm willing to give it to you free. All you got to do is take it. Okay, I want to give it, Ken. If anyone wants this, all they got to do is come up and take it. If anyone wants a twit, he got it. God hands us the Holy Spirit. God hands us his sacrifice. He hands us forgiveness, but we have to take it. And and the act of taking it is not an act of righteousness. It's not an act of merits on our base. It's the reception of the grace and mercy of God. God doesn't withhold it and say, no, 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 you got to be a little taller there, Isaiah. You got to comb your hair a little better. He offers it as a free gift, and we reach out to it. So the sin that condemns us ultimately, the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, the, the unpardonable sin is not a sin that we're like, God, I'm trying to get it, but it's just so high. It's the sin of rejecting the forgiveness of God that He freely offers. It's like going to the doctor of your own volition, and the doctor saying, I hate bad news, you got a terrible disease, but the good news is there's a cure, let's get you scheduled for the cure, and you go, no, no, wait a minute, I don't, you're no doc. I'm a better doctor than you, I have no disease, I have no problem, and I'm going to reject what you're telling me. That's what blasphemy in the Holy Spirit is, is God sends the Spirit and He says, there's a problem in your life, but there's a good news, I've got the solution, and you say, no, Holy Spirit, I'm going to blaspheme you, I don't want your cure, and I reject what you're offering me. Neither do I condemn you is the first act of those who are, by the merits of Christ, forgiving those who've offended us. Or when we go to Christ, He forgives us. The go and sin no more is then the response of the person who's been forgiven. It is to be the transformational power that changes our lives. Now, in order for there to be reconciliation, both of these must be in play at the same time. Forgiveness, and forgive me if I'm repetitive, Forgiveness does not mean we just continue to receive abuse. Oh, you, you, you lied and stole from me, and I forgive you, but let's just get, I'm going to keep loaning you the money. 
Oh, and I'm just going to keep forgiving you. Or you're going to beat me up every time we are on the playground. I'm just going to keep forgiving you. No, there's an expectation. And this is where the story of Joseph and the story of Jesus asking Peter three times, do you love me, comes into it. There can be an expectation in the life of one forgiven that the forgiveness is going to transform them to live a better life. So there's a responsibility of the forgiver and the forgiven in this statement. Now, the problem is the devil pulls us to one of the extremes. There's a ditch on every side of the truth. And the devil pulls us to one of two extremes when it comes to forgiveness. The first is the idea of neither do I condemn you, so go ahead and keep doing what you've been doing. Go ahead and sin. And the second part would negate the first by doing this, and it's a way of saying, well, it really wasn't that big of a deal. I'm not going to hold you accountable. It wasn't your fault. You couldn't control it, so you can just continue the behaviors. This is the the worldly way of looking at forgiveness. This is the king of the south. This is the liberal theology, not political, okay, liberal way of looking at it, that sin doesn't really have any uh, uh, big deal, so we should just forgive people and not expect there to be a change in their life. The other one is the reverse of that. This is the, this is the, uh, the uh, legalistic side, the, the, uh, the religious uh, extremist side, the uh, uh, king of the north side and all those things. And uh, it's a, a barrier of I'm going to condemn you until I see that there's been change in your life. Another way of, of, is, is to reverse this out of the order. Go and sin no more and then we'll talk about whether or not you're forgiven. Do you see the differences in these? Now, these are not just missing the mark. These are corruptions of forgiveness. One drop of this in the cup of forgiveness poisons the entire concoction. Forgiveness is offered freely first because of Jesus Christ. Because He freely forgave you, so also should we freely forgive those who offend us. And then the responsibility of reformation in the life of the person who has been forgiven needs to be expected. So in these stories and in these illustrations, God continues to give us uh, the, the basic foundation of understanding the power of forgiveness. There's a responsibility, obviously, on both parts. We've been studying Ephesians in our um, adult Sabbath school quarterly, uh, those who take part in that. Ephesians 1, in Him we have redemption through His blood, all forgiveness, all forgiveness is traced to the shed blood of Jesus Christ because of His work on the cross, because of His taking the penalty, even our forgiving our fellow man is based upon the cross of Jesus Christ. And anytime we withhold forgiveness, we negate the power of Jesus on the cross. In Him we have redemption through His blood, forgiveness of our trespasses. Notice this, this is so beautiful. According to the riches of His grace, which He lavishes on us. Don't miss this too when it comes to forgiveness. Forgiveness is not chintzy. Forgiveness is not limited. Forgiveness is not cheap. When God forgives us, it's not like he has a little vial and he's like, I don't want to run out, so there's a drop. Did you get any? And I got to be careful not. He has riches of mercy and grace that he wants to lavish. Isn't that a beautiful word? Lavish. He wants to pour his forgiveness upon us abundantly, cleanse us, anoint us, baptize us with power of the Holy Spirit to fully cover us with his forgiveness. So also, and this has been a a, a big theme of mine through this, so many times when we study forgiveness, it's about the sinner and the Lord, and and that's definitely uh, an element, but I want us to also appreciate the transformation that comes in our hearts as we forgive our fellow man. So also should we be willing and prepared, and because of Jesus Christ, lavish forgiveness on those who have harmed us, not because we are good and smart and wise and have merits, but because we understand that God has lavished His forgiveness on us. Forgiveness that is limited, forgiveness that is chintzy, lacks power and will not be sustained. It must be a full expression of the power of God. We're going to continue to study this. We have a new story I want to look at today. This was all preview, getting up to there. I I shared earlier that when you study the great stories of forgiveness, you begin to see patterns 
emerge that, uh, that seem to be a golden thread that fits into the major narratives of forgiveness in the Bible. Not necessarily in every story. I talked about that there's often privacy. Joseph wanted to be alone with his brothers when he revealed himself to his brothers. The woman caught in adultery was alone with Jesus. Jesus was alone with His disciples when He talked to Peter uh, three times and said, did you love me? So, there is a time of privacy uh, uh, that goes through many of these stories. There's often a great reveal, like when Joseph said, I am your brother Joseph, how's my father? When Nathan says to David, thou art the man, you kind of have these moments of great reveal. Or even with Jonah, when God says to Jonah, you had compassion on a plant? How is it that you don't understand that I want to have a compassion on on a city of 120,000 people? You have a great reveal. But another little golden thread through many of the stories of forgiveness is the motif of being carried, being carried. The woman caught in adultery did not come of her own volition. She didn't just say, hey, look, there's Jesus. I want to go be forgiven. She was brought. She was carried. Um... The man uh, on the litter who was carried to Jesus and taken down through the roof, remember that? The first words of Jesus to that man are, son, your sons are forgiven. We are to carry one another's burdens, uh, Galatians chapter 6 says. The Ark of the Covenant had to be carried. It was not allowed to go on a cart. You remember the story of how Jesus instructed the Levites to carry? They had to carry the Ark of the Covenant because the Ark of the Covenant had the seat of mercy on it. And mercy had to be carried. There's this theme of being carried. We are to carry our crosses. We are to lift up Christ. The theme of being carried is also another motif that weaves its way through many of the great stories of forgiveness. So I want to talk about the story of someone who is carried to the table, a king, a cripple, and what's lost is found. I'm going to jump into the Old Testament now. I'm going to bounce back and forth a little bit in these great stories of forgiveness. We're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Some of you may know this story. Uh, It's another one that just jumps from the pages of the Bible. But I want you to notice the parallels in some of the previous stories we've looked, primarily last week's story of the woman who was brought to Jesus, and compare and contrast now this story in the Old Testament with King David. A woman who was brought to the son of David versus King David and his expression of forgiveness. 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to have to get into the story to build up the context here. David said, is there anyone yet left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, just so you know the context, David has been king for about 20 years now. He is about 50 years old, and he's finally got to a place of kind of uh, peace. There had been a civil war between the forces of Saul the remnants of the house of Saul and and those who supported David. Then the other nations around also saw weakness and attacked Israel. David has finally solidified his kingdom. He's put down all the major fights. He's sitting on his throne, and he just knows there is a problem in his heart. Have you ever had that before? There's no battle going on in your life, but you just feel in your heart that something's not right. Somewhere there is something not right. And David senses this. He is not required to do anything at this time. He is the established king, but he realizes in his heart that he needs to express forgiveness to someone. He doesn't even know who it is, but he thinks it's probably someone related to the house of Saul. So he says, is there anyone yet left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? Now, this word kindness is not just your general nicety kindness. This is the, 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 the Old Testament word for agape love to show the compassion, the power of God, the kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now, Jonathan was the son of Saul who was the best friend of David. Jonathan dies in the same battle that Saul does. And Jonathan in this story is a type of Christ. He's a type of Christ. For Jonathan's sake, David says, I don't want Jonathan, my friend, to have died in vain. Is there anyone yet left of the house and family and relatives of Jonathan that I can express the kindness of God? In a way, that's like what Jesus says. God says, I don't want the sacrifice of Christ to go in vain. I need to seek out and find anyone who is part of the family and the, 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 the fellowship of Christ and make sure that we are all right with one another. So Jonathan is a type of Christ in this. 
Verse 3, the king said, is there not yet anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba, who had been a servant of Saul, Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in his feet. Okay? So there is a remaining grandson of Saul, son of Jonathan, but he says he is crippled in both feet. Now, uh, I, I need to share with you, this is not your normal word for cripple. It doesn't just mean he's hobbled or he's lame. There's other words that the Hebrew use. This word is only found four times in all the Old Testament, twice to refer to this individual, two other times to refer to the absolute ab, uh, abject humility of the soul when we stand before God. Here's the point. It is likely, and I'm going to suggest to you today, that he didn't just have a broken bone that didn't heal right. He didn't just have a club foot or something like that. He was paralyzed. He was a paraplegic. He was crippled in both feet. The only way of understanding what that would mean, differentiating it from the other words to talk about those who couldn't use their legs, is his was complete paralysis. Now, what kind of a life do you think you had a thousand years before the time of Christ if you were a paraplegic? It's not easy today. It was a, probably a pretty rough life. And the king said to him, where is he? Ziba said to the king, he's in the house of Makir and, and the son uh, of Emil in Lodabar. Now, so let's get into the story. Where did this kid come from? Go back now in your Bibles, and we're told exactly what happened. Second Samuel chapter 4, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son crippled, that's the word again, crippled, paralyzed in his feet. He was five years old when the report of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. The report of their death came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened that in her hurry to flee, he fell and became lame. There's another word, the more common word for those who are cripples. And his name was Mephibosheth. So here, can you, can you get the picture? Saul had turned his back on God. Saul was not following what God wanted to do, and he got himself into a disastrous situation to the point where in battle he receives a mortal wound. He doesn't want the Philistines to kill him, so he falls on his sword. It's tragic. His other sons are, mur- or are killed in battle at the same time. So when this happens, word comes to the palace. This is very important. Word comes to the palace, the king and his sons are dead. So everyone in the palace flees. Why? Why would they flee hearing that Saul and his sons are dead? You know, I, uh, I love nature videos, uh, learning a lot about God's creation. I just recently watched a, a great uh, presentation on lions in Africa. You know, they live in prides, and those prides are led by an alpha male, one male in the pride, usually with several lionesses. You guys have seen nature, right? You know these things. And that male dominates the pride. He won't let any other males mate or have children. As soon as other males grow up, he kicks them out. But eventually that male gets old. Eventually that male alpha lion can no longer maintain his dominance over the pride, and a rogue male, seeing his weakness, will come in and drive him out or even kill him. Do you know the first thing that rogue male does when he takes over that pride? He slaughters every cub that is not his in that pride. And even the juveniles, he'll either kill or drive out. So that he and he alone is the master and the only father of that pride. It's the law of the jungle, isn't it? And the lions aren't the only animals that do this either. Many of the big carnivores, bears, uh, tigers, they have the same thing. When a new male takes over territory, they slaughter all the babies. Why did Mephibosheth have to flee at five years old? The nurse hears the news, Mephibosheth, we got to get out of here. Why? Why? He's five. He's not, you know, two. Why? Because, I hate, hate to say it, but the king's dead. Oh, even your father, he's not coming back. We got to go. Why? Because a new king is coming. What, what are you talking about? Well, you know how David and your, your, your grandfather fought. David now wants to be king. You mean Uncle David? Remember Jonathan and David. 
Uncle David, he's a great guy. No, you don't understand. If David comes and sees you here, he's going to slaughter you. What? And in their haste to flee, Mephibosheth is dropped, probably breaks his spine and becomes paralyzed. So I want you to think about what Mephibosheth lost that day. What Mephibosheth lost, he loses his father, his grandfather and his king. He loses his home. He loses his legs. He loses his right to the throne. Mephibosheth loses everything at the age of five. And who does he blame? David. David. While fleeing in panic, Mephibosheth is crippled at the age of five. For 20 years, he's lived as a cripple, hiding and hating David. He even lives in a place called Lo Debar. That literally means nowhere. Not Guardians of the Galaxy nowhere either, by the way. It literally means Timbuktu, you know, the hinterlands. Low is the negation. Debar means a thing. It's no place. He has lost everything. And for 20 years, he has lived as a paraplegic. For 20 years, he has lived nowhere. For 20 years, he has hated the king who is now in Jerusalem. You know, we're not just supposed to read our Bibles. We're to meditate on it. We're to get into the story. Look at the very next verse in 2 Samuel 9. So David learns of this crippled son of Jonathan. And he says, Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Emil, from Lodabar. It's about a day's ride from Jerusalem. Lodabar is on the east side of the Jordan River. We know where it is. It's about a day's ride if you're able to ride a horse or a donkey or a camel, okay? This is so important to understand. Put yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes. You're living in Lodabar, and you hear, who is it? We're envoys of the king. We're here to see Mephibosheth. King? What king? Oh, King David. Right? Heart starts beating. He's found me. After 20, he finally has found me, and now he's going to kill me. Uh, uh, you've got the wrong house. I think it's the other one down the road. No Mephibosheth here. No, we think we've got the right. Are you sure? We think we've got the right. No, nobody here. And maybe he's asking his servants, hide me, hide me, put me under the bed, put me in the closet. David's finally found me. My life is over. What little life that I had as a crippled paraplegic, having no ability to be a man at all. And now what little I have is gone. Oh, we're coming in. The king said he wants to see you. Can't walk. No wheelchairs or motorized chairs. They pick him up. He can't ride a horse or a camel. You can't do that without things. So they probably have to load him in a wagon. And it probably took longer than a day to transport him from Lodabar to Jerusalem. What is on his mind that entire trip? Tell me, tell me, what does David want from you? That's the king's business. We're just his servants. We don't know the king's business. He just said he wants to see you, Mephibosheth. What does Mephibosheth think is going to happen to him when he's in front of David? Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, carried. He can't walk. He is carried, probably fairly humiliating, and laid before David. It says he fell on his face and prostrated himself. This isn't a sign of of, uh, worship or anything like that. This is abject fear. David said to him, Mephibosheth, he said, here's your servant. Just the kind of typical response. Yep, I'm here. Notice the first words of David. David sees the panic. David sees the abject terror. Surround. He's probably trembling. David says to him, do not fear. You 
need to be afraid. I'm going to surely show you kindness for your sake, to you, for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Who eats at the king's table regularly? Just strangers? Just the neighborhood? Only the king's family. I mean, others for political reasons, state dinners and stuff like that. But the only people who eat at the king's table regularly are his family. Mephibosheth is so filled with fear and anxiety, it's like he doesn't even quite hear what David says. So he responds to him again. He prostrated and said, what is your servant that you should regard a worthless dead dog like me. He thought he was a dead dog. He thought this was a game. He thought this was a ploy. He thought his life was over. How, how are you going to do this for someone who has no value, who was your enemy, and who you've already taken so much from? I am nothing. How are you going to do this to me? But David continues, the king called the servant of Saul, Ziba, and said to him, all that belonged to Saul all to his house, I have given, I'm restoring it back to Mephibosheth. He's going to have everything that was lost is going right back to him. He commands that Ziba and his sons become the servants and the farmers and those who would take care of him. But he says, nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall eat at my table regularly. And then it goes right out and says it in verse 11. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. And while we don't have the dialogue, we don't have the narrative of exactly what transpired in that moment, the power of God, the power of reconciliation and forgiveness, the willingness of David to show the abject forgiveness of God, not even realizing or understanding probably that Mephibosheth blamed him for everything. Mephibosheth hated David, but through the miracle of the Holy Spirit working in this, some transformation takes place so deep in the life of Mephibosheth that when one of David's own sons does rebel against him, his name is Absalom, when Absalom overthrows the kingdom, when Absalom drives David out of Jerusalem, when Absalom defiles himself and does all types of evil things, you want to know who came and came to David's side to support him? Mephibosheth. One who had at one time been an enemy, one who at one time had hated, one who at one time was living in literally a place that meant nowhere, now because of the love and generosity of David has been restored to such a kinship that he sees himself now as an invited member of the family of David. And in order for Mephibosheth to experience that every single day, he would have to be carried to the table. He'd have to be carried in someone's arms and sat at the table every time they ate together. Where do we fit in this story? We too were crippled in a fall. We call it the Garden of Eden. And because of that moment in human history and the brokenness that came into the human condition, we too don't walk right. We too have a paralysis that prevents us from achieving all that God wants us to do. We too are crippled. We too were enemies of the king. You may not have ever thought, well, I hate God, but every time you embrace selfishness, every time you reject mercy, every time you go your own way, you push back against what you know to be true, you show yourselves to be an enemy of God. We too viewed God as an oppressor when we sin. We too were in a hopeless situation. We too were sought and found. Unlike the woman who was brought to Jesus. In the story of David, he seeks out someone to express the kindness of God. And we, we fall into these categories ourselves. 
We too have been offered a seat at the king of the table. We too have become sons and daughters of God. And by His love, every time we commune with the Lord, it's because His grace and His kindness and His mercy carries us to His table. It's not by our merits or by our righteousness. His mercy and grace carries us to His table so we can commune. Remember a few uh, months ago, I talked about Psalm 23 where it says, He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. What a beautiful way of illustrating our relationship with God. He prepares a table. He invites us to His table to show how much He loves us. A few years ago, Leland put this story to song, and they uh, sang the song, Carried to the Table. So I want to have Brendan and Basti, I asked them to come up uh, to work on this song, and I'm so grateful that they uh, were willing to do that. So um, just meditate on this as you hear this song, and then I'll have a closing prayer at the end.